estimated we sleep for about a third of our lives. Is this a big waste of time? Could we be doing something more productive instead? Or is sleep a vital part of our health and well-being that we may have been neglecting for far too long? Let's find out. The topic for today is all about sleep. I'll be discussing how modern culture is affecting our sleep habits, what actually happens to our bodies whilst we sleep, what are the health consequences of sleep deprivation, and finally my top 10 tips on how we can all be sleeping a little bit better. <laughs> I wasn't really taught much about sleep at medical school, which is kind of bonkers when you think that you can survive about 25 days without food, but only 11 days without sleep, that's the longest anyone's ever gone. And we know that poor sleep is linked to all-cause mortality, and what that means is essentially you're less likely to live as long if you have poor sleep. And yet we're living in what's been termed an epidemic of sleeplessness, where low level exhaustion has just become the norm. We have 24 seven lighting. And if you work really long hours, that's just a sign of dedication and stamina. And all this means that we're ending up sleeping 20% less than we did in the 1940s. I mean, that's a really huge amount. So it must be having some kind of ramifications, right? We can at least put an economic figure on this. We know that poor sleep costs the UK economy about 2% of its GDP per year, which equates to 30 billion pounds. In America, we think that 100,000 road traffic accidents are linked somehow to the driver being tired. In fact, 31% of drivers admit to falling asleep at the wheel at least once in their life. 24 hours of wakefulness is the equivalent to being over the alcohol limit for drink driving. So we know that it's dangerous to be sleep deprived. Let's find out a little bit more about what happens when we are asleep. There are three stages of what's called non-REM sleep and REM sleep, which you may have heard of. So the first stage of non-REM sleep lasts about five minutes. This is when we're just starting to feel a little bit sleepy. And this is thank you to the pineal gland pumping out melatonin, which is the hormone that makes us feel all nice and sleepy. And sometimes you might get those strange muscle twitches at this point. So after those five minutes are up, then you're into stage two of non-REM sleep. And this takes up about half of all your total sleep time. And in this stage, we have what's called sleep spindles, if you're looking at an EEG, which measures the brain waves. And these are little electric sparks, and these are linked to memory consolidation and also learning new things. In fact, if you've learned something new that day and you've been practicing the piano, you'll have more of these spindles on the EEG. And during this cycle, it helps your brain clear out old memories, declutter and consolidate memories it does want to keep. Eventually you'll move into stage three of non-REM sleep. And this is where you're almost like in a coma-like state. You have slow big delta waves on the EEG. And this part of sleep is what makes you feel really refreshed when you wake up in the morning. Finally, we move on to REM sleep. During this point, our heart rate increases, our body gets cold, our limbic system is activated, which is linked to our emotional connectivity. Our sexual organs become engorged. So sometimes you can have dreams that are very emotional or sexual, and that's all because you're in REM sleep. Thinking another thing about emotions is that our noradrenaline levels drop when we're asleep. And this helps us feel less concerned about problems when we wake up in the morning. But if you're not getting this sleep, then it's more difficult to navigate the social and emotional world the next day. Something else really interesting that happens when we're asleep is kind of like mental housekeeping. The rest of the body has a lymphatic system which helps drain away all the old cell rubbish, but there's no room for a lymphatic system in the brain. So what happens is whilst we sleep, the cells deflate by 60% to allow room for cerebrospinal fluid, CSF, to rush through the cells, clear out all that old debris and clean out the system. Isn't that amazing? I think that's really amazing. So essentially, whilst we're sleeping, our brain is like on a dishwasher cycle and it is flushing out all those old cells and proteins to prevent them building up. So let's talk about what happens if we're not having this waste disposal service. We know that the protein amyloid beta is cleared twice as fast when we're asleep than when we're awake. And this same protein is linked to Alzheimer's disease where it does build up. So we believe there is a really strong link between poor sleep and Alzheimer's and there's lots of research coming forward to find out more about this. So we know that if you're not getting enough sleep, you're potentially putting yourself at risk of Alzheimer's and memory problems. So what other health consequences are there of this sleep deprivation? Well, really simply, if you're getting less than five hours sleep a night, then you're four times more likely to catch a cold. But on a bigger scale, there is a whole host of chronic diseases linked to poor sleep. And they include 
chronic inflammation, obesity, type 2 diabetes, metabolic syndrome, cancers including breast, prostate and colon cancer and coronary artery disease. In fact, in the UK we have daylight savings time every year where we lose an hour in spring, during which time there is an increase of heart attacks of 24%. In autumn, when we gain an hour's sleep, there is a decrease in heart attacks of 21%. We can't say for certain that it's linked to that hour's sleep, but the evidence would suggest there's certainly a strong link. One of the biggest topics covered in the evidence with sleep deprivation is obesity and weight gain. And obviously a lot of people are interested in this. So we know that if you have five or less hours sleep a night, then you have a 50% likelihood of becoming obese. That's an amazing statistic. And why do we think this is? Well, I think there's a threefold reason that there is a link with poor sleep and weight gain. Firstly, as we all know, if you are tired and you've not slept well, then you don't make good food choices. Um, a study from the University of Chicago showed that people eat an average 300 more calories in a buffet if they are tired. We all reach for the biscuits. So you've got a bigger energy intake. Second reason, we have a decreased energy outtake. And what I mean by that is, you can't be bothered to go to the gym, you're too tired. <laughs> so we generally don't do as much exercise when we're tired. And the third reason is linked to hormones. We know that there is a 20% increase in a hormone called ghrelin when we are tired. And this is the hormone that makes us feel hungry. We also have an increase in the hormone called cortisol, which gives us a bigger appetite. So you're hungrier and you've got a bigger appetite. It's not a good recipe for weight loss. If you're trying to diet, but you haven't slept well, we know that 70% of your weight will come from lean muscle mass, which is not what you want to be doing. So we know that if you're tired, you've got low motivation, you're going to exercise at a lower intensity and overall it's going to be less efficient exercise. We know that if you're tired, especially when we're looking at athletes, they've got an increased risk of injury. On the flip side, if you are well slept, then this enhances your recovery time. And this is probably the reason that a lot of athletes sleep between 10 and 12 hours. Roger Federer sleeps 12 hours a night. Usain Bolt says he never sleeps less than nine hours a night. So we should be looking to them as examples of what we could be doing a bit better. The last topic I want to talk to you today about is mental health and poor sleep. We know that there is not one single mental health problem that does not have a correlation with poor sleep. We've always thought about it as just a symptom of the mental health problem, but things might be starting to change. Last year from the University of Oxford, there was a study where participants were given an online CBT course to try and improve their sleep. The results were they had reduced insomnia, paranoia and hallucinations just from this improved sleep. So we need to start thinking about sleep as more as a causative factor in mental health. Finally, I want to give you all my 10 top tips to improve sleep. Number one, consistency. Try and go to bed and wake up about the same time every day, even on a weekend. And if you have kids, this might be actually easy because kids wake up the same time every day anyway, but you just have to go to bed at the same time every night. Tip number two, avoid caffeine after lunch. Now we all know that caffeine impairs our sleep and so many patients say to me, oh, but it doesn't affect me doctor. I can have a cup of coffee before I go to bed and still sleep well. No, you think you're sleeping well, but you're not reaching that deep sleep where you have those nice big delta waves that help you feel refreshed the next day. Did you know that caffeine has got a six hour half-life? That means there's still half of it within your system after six hours, which means there's still a quarter of it in your system after 12 hours. You wouldn't think about having a quarter of a cup of coffee just before you went to bed and expect to sleep well, would you? Caffeine is a stimulant, so I recommend you have your caffeine before lunch or during lunch and then just move to decaf after that. Tip number three is about alcohol. I know you hate me already, you don't want me to say this, but alcohol is not good for sleep. We all enjoy a glass of wine, especially when the kids have gone to bed, but actually alcohol sedates you, it doesn't help you sleep. Even though you think having a nightcap might help you sleep, it doesn't, it actually fragments your sleep and it blocks REM sleep. If you are going to have a drink, try and restrict it to at least three hours before you go to bed and that way you'll sleep a little bit better. Uh-oh, gonna need a cloth. Oh shit. Tip number four. Nice and simple, don't eat your dinner too late. An evening meal very late at night can make you feel full and you're busy digesting and not very good at sleeping. Tip number five. Try and do some exercise every day. Whether it's just walking with the kids to school or doing anything you can, it'll help you sleep better that night. Tip number six. Avoid light before bed. Now we all know that we shouldn't really be using our screens before bed, but this really is quite an important point, even if you flicked it onto your night mode on your iPhone. 
This is because that artificial light still sends messages to our brain that it's daytime and stops that melatonin from increasing and that's the hormone that makes us feel nice and sleepy. So when you go in your bathroom and you put that bright light on to clean your teeth, your brain is really confused and stops getting ready for sleep. Tip number seven, try and get some sunshine. So when you wake up in the morning, whether you're not, you're sitting by the window to try and get some daylight, or you walk a little bit further from your car to the office, just try and let your brain find out it's daytime, there's lots of sunshine, wake up. Tip number eight. If you are struggling to sleep and you've laid in bed for more than 20 minutes, then get out of bed. Sounds crazy. But go into a dark room and do something that makes you still sleepy, like listening to a podcast. And then when you do feel tired, go back to bed. And this way, you'll stop associating your bed with a place where you can't sleep and are tossing and turning and feel horrible. Tip number nine, avoid napping. If you've had a terrible night's sleep, the temptation is to have a nap. But this is actually not a good idea. You're better off just admitting that you're going to be tired that day and then go to bed at the normal time as usual and you'll feel better the next day. And my final tip, tip number 10, is try and keep your room cool. Cooler than you might think, about 18 degrees, which does feel a bit cold, but actually your body sleeps much better when it's nice and cool. So I hope you enjoyed my top 10 tips for sleep and I hope you'll start to prioritise sleep in your life. You may end up feeling happier and healthier. And don't forget, if you're interested in lifestyle medicine, then you can watch some more of my videos on my page if you just click like and subscribe. And there's lots more videos to come in the future. Bye-bye.